Thank you for coming. By the way, coffee and donuts, if anybody missed them, are in there. Um, and they'll be available right after the presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Tom and Brian and let them get after it. So, thank you guys. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I, I, it's a great turnout. I didn't expect this on a, on a midi, midi Saturday, so that's good. Also, restrooms in there if anybody needs it. Um, so yeah, we're here to kind of talk about transmissions in general, but also kind of get into some, some of the insight of the PDK. Um, so, we're Atlanta Speedworks. We opened this shop in 2014. Uh, we started as just a race shop. We have now morphed into doing a lot of street and race. Um, we're, as kind of the obvious thing here is we're doing a lot of PDK service. We're one of the two shops in the country that can actually service a PDK in terms of rebuilds and repairs. Um, so we've learned a lot over the last couple of years and uh, we're now, you know, I would say probably seven or eight of the cars sitting here in the shop are here for PDK repairs. So wow. That's uh, not it's, good. it's something that we've <laughs> just kind of found our niche and gotten into and here we are. So, yeah. um, so we are, uh, you know, we do, like I said, lots of different portion services. We've got uh, a new facility we just opened up uh, in Cleveland, Georgia, that was uh, Jake Raby's facility. Um, so we're doing engines, some transmission work up there. We've got a dyno up there now. Uh, we're doing some tuning, that sort of stuff. So a little bit of everything. Um, we are also a super installer for the IMS solution and with uh, LN engines. Uh, while we're talking about LN, I would like to point out uh, Judd's here from LN Engineering. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Nice to meet you guys. So he's yeah, the guy yeah, that if yeah. you're calling LN to get anything, you're talking to him. So uh, appreciate having him here. He's a great, great resource for information and uh, and parts. So, uh, we have grown rapidly this year alone. Uh, we've got four new techs that have started with us. I've got three new lifts going in down here uh, mm -hmm. next week. And as I said, we opened our, our second location. So that's what we're all about. Um, so just kind of a quick overview of what we're going to be covering, um, how the PDK works, um, talking about some manual versus uh, auto shifting, sport plus modes, uh, talking about service and repair and some of the costs involved with that. And then we're going to dip into a little bit about manual transmissions, um, just kind of talking about some of the basics on those, um, just you know, in case anybody has questions or kind of wants to know a little bit about it. But, uh, first thing I'd like to do, is kind of some basic explanations of what it is. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. Uh, <laughs> nope. But I will do the translation, the double clutch transmission. So um, basically what that means is you've got two clutches. And one clutch controls reverse, first, third, fifth, and seventh, basically every other gear. And then you've got another clutch that controls two, four, and six. So basically what that means is the next gear is pre-engaged so that when you go to shift, it just basically switches clutches and automatically goes into the next gear almost to, uh, almost instantaneously, about uh, 0.1 seconds. So it's a very quick shift, um, quicker than any human can do it, even on a manual. Um, and some of the other benefits, you get you get auto blip on a downshift, so it rev matches as you're as you're downshifting. Um, the other. I, we consider, especially for the track, a real big benefit is the programming kind of keeps you from over revving engines on a downshift. So, you know, it won't let you downshift if the RPMs are going to jump up too high. Um, it's not 100% foolproof. You can get into like rev one or range one over revs, but those are not engine damaging whatsoever and not something to worry about. Um, and, and, and the biggest thing is the driver is it allows the driver to focus on driving, whether it's street, track, whatever. You're not focused on shifting. Um, that's really important on the track when you're trying to downshift in a brake zone and threshold brake and you've got maybe you're passing somebody and you're trying to think about shifting instead of what you're actually doing driving the car. So it's a pretty huge benefit there. Um, so um, and just a little personal note, I'm a purist, so I was all about you know manual shifting and, and you know over the years of my racing that's I've gotten really good at it. But I will tell you, the first time I drove a PDK, I just kind of went, wow, this is a game changer. So it, it's, it's a pretty cool deal. Um, you know, as a driver, you can't beat it uh, with a manual transmission. So uh, I'm going to do my best to get an operation video up here. Just give me a second. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> you never know what kind of commercial we're going to yeah, have. Yeah, we, we tried this earlier this morning and the commercial that came up, you didn't want to see it. <laughs> BDK is essentially two gearboxes in one. Each gearbox features a separate wet clutch where the components are continuously lubricated. Sequentially, these two clutches alternately connect the two gearboxes with the engine via two separate drive shafts, depending on the selected gear. The principle behind this is overlapping transmission. When a particular gear is engaged, the next gear is already being pre-selected in the other gearbox. One clutch opens within milliseconds while the other clutch closes, resulting in a barely perceptible gear change. Whether you use the ergonomic sports steering wheel for PDK to change gear manually or drive in automatic mode. In total, PDK offers seven gears. Maximum speed is reached in sixth gear, while the seventh gear for optimized performance further reduces fuel consumption. Unfortunately, for us to have a cutaway of a transmission would be extremely expensive, but you could see from the video kind of some of the cutaways that they did graphically. Um, very complicated units. Uh, there's a lot going on. We've got a, a transmission here that actually is, has just been re rebuilt. Um, there's a lot going on in there as you can see. It's not nearly as simple as a manual and it's not nearly as simple as uh, you know just a, a, a regular automatic transmission. So there's a lot going on not only mechanically but there's a lot going on in terms of the controls. Um, these <coughs> units have a TCU which is transmission control unit. So they basically have their own controller, um, and as well, there's a valve body, um, which we you have. Know, we'll get into it later, but um, yeah, Blue right. is there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, there's a valve body that also has solenoids that basically send the fluid where it needs to go, and basically actuate clutches and things like that. So, <laughs> extremely complicated unit, German engineering, very well done, um, but it is it does have its own issues. So. Yes. Um, So, just to kind of give everybody a sense of what we got going on in parts, um, we got some parts up here we can talk about. Brian, would you like to kind of run through these kind of one by one? Uh, well, well, we'll start with your, your dual clutches. So, this first one, you guys can gladly come look at this before. Uh, you've got your outer clutch, which is here, with your frictions and your discs, and then you have your inner clutch. This is what actually transmits the, the engine power through and it's all controlled electronically. Works great, amazing. I, I personally love them. <laughs> um, what most people seem to don't understand and don't know, your PDK actually has a dual mass flywheel. And lately we've had a, a very big run of them going bad. If you're experiencing a, coming up to a stoplight, if you feel a clunk or a hard shift into first gear, very possible that your flywheel is going bad. So inside here, there's, so you've got an inner half and outer half. In between the two halves, there's grease, and that grease will sling out through the seal, and that's why you're feeling that hard clunk at a coming up first gear and a downshift, which it uh, makes a big mess when it does. And aha, uh -huh, here's the valve body. <coughs> this is. Are there visual indications that that's starting to happen? Like if you nothing you can see externally. We get indication when we pull it, we can see that it's slung the grease out, and then, <coughs> then we have to buy it. Which are not cheap. And nor are they. Sometimes they're in the States, a lot of times we've got to get them from Germany. Um, here's your valve body, which are the, these, and here's all your solenoids. So this valve body, what most don't understand, unlike your, your typical automatic valve body, you can take them apart. Once you split these apart, they're garbage. 
there's a bonded, they're bonded together. So you, we can replace the selenites, but we cannot open this. The manufacturer of this doesn't sell this bonded plate. Go figure. And an interesting little story about that particular one. <laughs> this one exactly. We had a customer from Miami got a hold of us and said, hey, I just bought this car, I've had it two weeks, and it's not shipped. <laughs> so he sent it up to us, we pulled this valve body out, and noticed that there's all sorts of Sharpie writing all over the valve body. So a dealer previously had pulled that out and done something to it. Near as we can tell, they actually took it apart, which is a big no-no, because now it doesn't work. So we're now having to put a new valve body in for the customer because it was attempted to be serviced and it was launched. So things like that are, you know, it's, so these things are very complicated and if, we, if somebody doesn't know what they're doing, it just makes it 10 times worse. But the, the solenoid, you can replace those? Yes. Yes, yeah, solenoids are absolutely replaceable and when we go in and do diagnostics, we get codes and it, it'll tell us solenoid, it, yeah. more or less it'll tell us that hey, you've got solenoid problems, and we go in and just rebuild and replace all the solenoids. And this goes on top of that. Yeah, this actually will sit. Just like that inside. That plate is the pan, actually. So yeah. We'll kind of get into that in a second. But that holds up into the transmission, the valve body does, and that's basically what kind of the TCU tells that what to do. And that's what controls the, the fluid flow and opening and closing and where it goes and how and everything else. So if, if any of you have been underneath your car and have a PDK and done your own oil service, you'll notice that you've got a plastic transmission pan. Um, I don't use the plastic ones when I go in and do a service. We all know how expensive that pan is. And plastic is more prone to breaking than aluminum. Aluminum is a better heat dissipation, and this is a serviceable pan. You buy it once, then you just change the filter in it. Makes life easier, it's cheaper for you as a customer. These failures, the seal failure and the valve body failure, are these like infrequent issues? Are they more towards the guys on the track? Are they just a little, yeah, well, that's. Great question. That's <laughs> well, next. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, the other parts that are the things that are serviceable, like you said, the, the valve body, the pan, the flywheel. The, fa the other failures that we're seeing is this is your distance sensor. Uh, this is the distance sensor. This is the speed sensor. And this goes here. This is basically inside the transmission. That's the distance sensor, and that's the speed sensor there. This is what reads what gear it's actually in. It, this, there's magnets and a lot of other complicated things in here, but it reads, it's like, hey, I'm in this gear and it tells the TCU, and this is what reads your, your speed. Both of these are replaceable now, uh, serviceable. We've done a, a fair number of them. <laughs> and most of the time, it, it uh, Yeah, that's about a 99% or 90% uh, repair. That, that takes care of 90% of the issues that, that people are having. So, so that's the most common. Do you, it, but that, is that a Porsche part or is that an aftermarket part? You're that's a Porsche part. That's right? the factory Porsche part. The okay. repair, the replacement part, which unfortunately we don't have any with us right now, but that's the updated version and the updated speed sensor. Um, so they are not Porsche parts. And the reason that we're using those is because Porsche still has not updated these to anything to take care of this problem. So if you go buy this and put it in, there's no guarantee that you're not going to have the same problem that road. You can actually, you can't actually buy that from Porsche. They won't sell it to you. <coughs> it's available on Allen Engineering. <laughs> 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 this, one, this is the one that's available. <laughs> yeah, the new one. Yeah. The, the billet one, not the stock one. Yeah. Yes. What? Yeah. And then some plate, same thing. When they fail, what's the, what are the symptoms? Uh, we'll get into that as well. Great question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Coming up. Coming up soon. Okay. Yes. All right. So, they, uh, so quick question. Yeah. Since Porsche says this is not a serviceable item, why? where are you getting your parts? Are these all aftermarket parts? Are you getting from the suppliers for Porsche? So 
yes, the, the sensors are aftermarket parts. Everything else is, you know, it's, it's Porsche supplier parts. And I can't tell you where I get them from or I have to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> and no, we cannot, we can't we sell can them parts. individually to anyone. Yeah, they're not allowed to per contract. So again, and again, I'm, I appreciate all the questions. We're going to get to those with probably one or two more slides. Um, still kind of going through some of the operation here. Um, in, in your auto mode, I mean, this is kind of obvious stuff, but uh, you can temporarily override it with the paddles, uh, but it will revert back to auto mode eventually. Um, it's the least performance, but the most kind of gentle, everyday driving type scenario. Um, and then you can go, of course, into manual mode. You can shift with driver input using the paddles or the lever. Um, gives the driver a little bit of control. Um, it still kind of doesn't do everything. It still reverts back to auto mode when you come to a stop or if it really needs to, feels like it needs to upshift. Um, and that's where Sport and Sport Plus modes come in. Those are kind of like uh, different levels of performance. So um, they're great for mountain roads, spirited driving, that sort of thing. Um, very aggressive shifting up and down, especially Sport Plus. It'll just hold the RPM at high RPM until you decide to do something with it. Um, it gives you a little bit less clutch slip. Um, it's, uh, on Sport Plus, it actually doesn't even release throttle on a shift. It'll just let that power go right through the transmission. Um, and so another thing that was mentioned in the video is it said top speed was in sixth gear, right? So in Sport Plus, it eliminates seventh gear. It takes it out of the equation because it's not faster than six. Um, and then what we found on track is the TCU at times when you're in, like especially in a corner where it's almost third, almost second, kind of in between, sometimes the TCU will do a mid-corner downshift on it. Um, there are ways to program that out, but it is, it is not fully manual in Sport Plus even on track. Uh, and you may find that even on the street if you're in Sport Plus. Yeah, it's, it's really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, I think we might get into some of the nitty gritty here. So, so some of the issues, and then getting back to the parts and, and some of the, the repairs. Um, generally, when it comes to the sensors, you're going to get something that shows transmission fault, possible no reverse gear, drive on as possible. Um, sometimes you can turn the car off, that'll clear and go away. It might not come back for a week, but then it's going to come back on you in the worst possible time. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we found is that people that continue to do that end up doing more damage internally um, as, as they basically try to just, you know, force it through that, that mode. Um, with the POIS and, and other scanners, you can pull up some of the codes. Those are the common ones for the distance sensor. Um, other symptoms, you know, it'll just go into limp mode. It'll skip a gear, you know, might skip third gear, might skip fourth gear. Um, and you may not have reverse. So those are very, very common symptoms that you'll have. Um, dealers will replace a TCU. Um, they will replace a valve body because they can. Um, but that is basically all as dealers that they are authorized to do from Porsche. And you can't really fault the dealers for that because they treat this stuff, they have to treat this stuff like a black box. Um, you know, can you imagine a dealer having all these cars lined up and having to pull transmissions apart and go through and do all this sort of stuff? It's just not the kind of thing they do. It's just like they don't repair engines. They don't rebuild engines at, at dealerships. Um, they just, they get a great engine, they drop it in. That's what they do. Same with the transmissions. Um, you know, they're not set up to repair, they're set up to replace. And again, you can't fault them for that. That's the best business case for them. And that's why indie shops exist, because we can do things that dealers don't have the time or capability to do. Um, so as we kind of touched on, we have replacement sensors available. Uh, position sensor, speed sensor, uh, and again we talked about a little bit, we can do full rebuilds including heavy duty clutches, that sort of thing. Um, so that's kind of that. Um, so other questions I think was yours. Um, failures do not seem to be correlated to the driving style or mileage. Um, it just, you know, I think as these cars age a little bit, you know, I don't know if it's, you know, sensors just going bad, that sort of stuff. And then of course with the clutches, yeah, mileage matters, right? That's wear and tear. So we start seeing 100,000 miles on a car. If it's in for transmission repair, it's probably time to do the rebuild at the same time. Um, generally speaking, we haven't had to rebuild anything under 100,000 miles. Um, I'm sure there's been one or two, but for other reasons than just um, you know, wear and tear. So, 
Um, it's a very, very small percentage of failures. So I, you know, I wouldn't let that kind of change my buying decision at all. Um, it's not something you really need to be worried about. It's a very, very low percentage, but it happens. And to be fair, the cars that we have even in the shop right now, I think New Jersey, Massachusetts, Florida, Texas, California. California. So it's not that they're all coming from Atlanta, right? You know, the repairs we're doing are coming from all over the country. So it's it's still, as you can imagine, that's just a sliver of the of the PDKs out there. So it's it's not something I think I would worry about. Um, track use with the higher heat it might slightly elevate it, but it's really really increasing wear more than anything, and it's still just an imperceptible amount because these clutches are not slipping a lot. Um, so. Um, now we get into what, what can you do to kind of help the cause a little bit? Regular PDK maintenance. And basically what that is is a fluid change. We change over to the aluminum pan, get a little bit more heat dissipation. Um, and then of course you have a serviceable pan where you can just change the filter instead of buying a new pan every time. Um, we recommend for normal street use about every 30,000 miles. Um, and, and generally that's because the fluid is the issue more than anything, you know, these cars, you, know, you guys aren't driving your cars 30,000 miles a year, so, you know, I mean, we've had cars that, we had a 2016 in here with 4,000 miles. It was so, actually an 11. An 11, yeah, mm -hmm. with 4,000 miles on it. Yes. So, you know, doing that service, it's just like oil, right? You don't let your oil sit in your engine for 10 years, right? It's, it's really the same thing with the transmission. Um, if you're doing track days, we kind of recommend about every six weekends. And if you're into hardcore racing, every other weekend is, is recommended. So, what's the cost to service the transmission? Coming right. <laughs> <laughs> we recommend different. We have gone to different fluids than what Porsche says because we've done some testing and seen better indications of the the clutch fluid rerun. We we saw 15 degree difference in the same car, two weekends, same track. And 15 degrees in temperature is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Definitely is. So sample costs, and this is kind of an out-the-door price. Uh, service is 1806, very specific because it's we know exactly what it is. And that's the first time. The second time it gets that's less because we don't have to buy an aluminum pan. Are they expensive? Buy a filter kit. Are the pans expensive? Uh, like 450. The, the, the what are they, Judd? <laughs> 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 we'll come back to well, now. So, but we, LN, the Judd's got our, our, our sub plate's a little different than the standard aluminum replacement. This is a billet package. This particular tra uh, uh, sub plate is thirteen forty nine. Now this adds capacity to it, but it is a serviceable, just like the ones that uh, Brian has up here on the bench. There's a serviceable filter. Uh, and it's buy it once and it's done. Uh, so it comes with a uh, Bill's aluminum drain plug that's got a magnet in it. So all of these things are helping your PDK. So, so but a plastic one is not uh, The plastic pan is actually more expensive than the yeah. one I've used, the aluminum aftermarket one. Yeah. Yeah. And the so one you've got the problem with the grease and the shift down the first gear where it was clogged. How does that fit into what you've got on the screen? Uh, that's, uh, so we can, we can do, um, well, you may have to get into that, but we yeah. go through this and then we may touch on the flywheel itself. Um, distance and speed sensors replaced. Uh, we're looking at somewhere between 8,500 and 9,500. Cane and Boxster, the trans does not have to come out. 911, it does have to come out. So that's kind of the difference in the prices. Full rebuild, you're looking at 16,500 to 19,500 with the sensors. Um, and that's again obviously transmission out full rebuild. Now you're now you're showing up with a transmission that's better than new at that point. Uh, new transmission, um, you know, somewhere in that twenty to thirty thousand dollar range from the dealership with installation. So that gives you kind of a sense of you know the scale there. Uh, if you want to talk about the flywheel in terms of replacement. So once the, the flywheel cost when when them go out, if we've seen them. Where they're fifteen hundred dollars, we've seen them twenty five hundred dollars. We new flywheel, new bolts, and when it's out, most of the time those guys are all doing a full rebuild anyway, and it doesn't add but another half hour to, to actually do it. It's just we don't know that we have to. We get indications that the customer says, "Yeah, we're feeling this." We've got an indication, but we don't one hundred percent know until we see the transmission out. 
And that's yeah. part of the full rebuild? That's no, that's an, that's, a, that's, a, that's an addition because we just yeah. don't know. Yeah, okay. Would you explain dual mass flywheels? Um, yeah, flywheel? so the, the flywheels are actually two halves that's been sealed together with the, there's two halves, it's got, I guess it's got fingers in them, and in between those fingers there's grease, and that grease is what damps, dampens the shift being up and down. When you're feeling that clunk, that grease is then gone, and you're, what you're hearing is the metal the two halves of the metal and the fingers hitting. I have I haven't seen one fail completely, but I can imagine that it is possible if the all of the grease comes out and it is gone. It feels like the transmission is gonna jump out of the car from yeah. underneath you because there's no damping left. It just it's amazing. You think the whole car just blew up and it's just that double cl that clutch mechanism in between the two halves. Is it yeah. making shrapnel? Is it yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. In the shade, metal off. Mm -hmm. At the track, uh, mm -hmm. in sports bus mode, it shifts at red light. Yeah. Yep. Yes. But the maximum torque is before red light. So, let's say red light is 7400 and is it is it okay to switch at 68 with the manual and not overheat? I mean, it, I assume at 68 if you don't heat the, the transmission it's as back much as red light. Yes, it does make it actually that makes a big difference if you back off just a little bit that five six hundred RPM makes a big difference in the heat yep. in how much heat it creates and which probably protects the sensor or whatever. Yeah, I mean the less heat the better. I mean just about anything engines transmissions. You know, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. 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 Save the manuals. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so as I said, I was a purist, now I'm kind of a convert. Um, I don't know, I didn't want to touch on too much of this, just some real basic stuff here. Um, you know, heel and toe techniques, anybody want to talk about that? Sure. Okay, well, so I'm not sure how I'm going to discuss this because I don't have pedals to deal with, but there's kind of two, two versions of heel and toe. One is the, let's take it for what exactly it says, you know, heel and toe, so if these are feet. Right, um, it would be essentially uh, keeping your toes on the brake and lifting your heel up and lifting the throttle. The other option, and what tends to work best for most people, is you keep your heel planted on the floor and you just roll your ankle or roll your knee and, and blip with the side of your foot. Um, that accomplishes a couple things in my view. Where when your heel is planted on the floor, you know exactly where your foot is at all times, and you're not like you know, and with your the side of your foot on the brake, you have pretty good modulation that way, versus if you lift your heel up, it's really difficult when you're blipping to keep that brake pressure the same. So those are kind of the two versions of that. I'm happy to answer more questions in detail after this, but it's kind of a quick overview. And this is to raise the engine, so to match when you're Yes, rev match it. Yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah just rev match on. Yep. And that saves a little bit of wear and tear on synchros and, and pretty much everything in the drivetrain. Um, if you don't rev match, one of the things that happens, um, you can actually start locking up rear tires and chattering the rear tires, which then start, sends all that shock through the drivetrain and can break all sorts of things. So, there's always a question about skipping gears on downshifts, um, whether you row through the gears, whether you just go from you know fifth down to third or second or something like that. It doesn't make a lot of difference. Um, I personally tend to go through each gear. That's to kind of help with that rev matching a little bit. And also, if for some reason you needed to accelerate to get away from a spinning car or something happening, at least you're in the right gear to do so. Um, the one thing you don't want to do is just put it in neutral and coast through a brake zone and just wait to downshift. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that on a manual transmission, um, if you're not shifting, keep your hand off the shifter. If you have your hand on the shifter, you're putting, um, putting some load into the synchronizers and, and other parts of the transmission and essentially wearing them out. We can tell that. We've done a lot of tra manual transmission rebuilds on race cars, and we can clearly see when a driver rests their hand on a shifter. We can see all sorts of things, the, drivers, the driver habits from, from just a rebuild. So it's pretty interesting. Um, and clutch life is a consideration. Um, you know, the upside is clutches are pretty easy to replace in a, in a manual car, unlike a PDK. 
Um, and then of course you have the synchronizer wear, which is generally when you start getting older, older or high mileage <coughs> cars, you start getting some grinding mowing into gear, or it might be tough to get into gear, or it might pop out of gear. Those are all kind of synchronizer issues. Um, so you know, there's pluses and minuses to, to each version. Anything else before? Do you do, make, do you do maintenance on old uh, 950 transmissions? Do we? 911? Uh, we don't. don't. Um, yeah, we, we're, we've gotten away from doing any kind of manual transmission work. Um, so we're just focusing on the PDK stuff right now. Yeah. Todd, are you going to talk about coaching? I could. Unsolicited. <laughs> <laughs> I met Todd a long time ago, got into stepping out of racing, and he co-drove with me and coached me. And even if you're not going to get into racing and you just want to be really mechanically sympathetic, um, Todd is a, a great one for that. He's unbelievably fast and never broke any of my stuff. <laughs> Except that one time. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, that, that was the BMW car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, so I, my background, I've like said, I, well, maybe I haven't said, but I've been racing for 42 years, started in go-karts as a kid, uh, so racing is just what I do and it's in my blood, but what I've been doing as part of our track environment is driver coaching. Um, to kind of clarify that, I don't ride along in right seats, that is scary as can be, I won't <laughs> ever do it. Um, and sadly, what really sucks about that is at least once a year, somebody gets killed driving, riding along in the right seat. So that's why I don't do it. It's not worth my, not worth the money. But having said that, with data and video, pretty much anybody can get driver coaching these days and learn something from it. If you're doing any kind of track driving whatsoever, even if you're you know entry level or whether you're a super experienced driver. Um, one of my co-drivers back in the day was some kid named Jordan Taylor. Um, I don't know what he's doing these days, but uh, he was, I think, 17 at the time. Um, and he was co-driver with me. I had a ton more experience, obviously, than he did at that time. And I was actually coaching him. And so, you know, now, you know, so it, it, my coaching experience spans from, from novice to, you know, expert at this point. So um, happy to help anybody, you know, at, at a track day. We're, we are the sponsor of the, the Peach State PCA track days. Uh, so we're always there. We're happy to, you know, happy to answer questions, look at video, whatever you guys would do if you're there. Um, and again, even if you just have questions on the street about defensive driving or offensive driving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's uh, kind of the conclusion of what we got. So we got questions? We got answers? brought a car in for service, what's the wait time on? So right now we are scheduling two to three weeks out, depending on what the service is and who we have available. As I said, we're adding lifts, we're adding techs. I'm actually actively hiring right now. So I would expect that time to come down to about a week or a week and a half pretty soon. So you've got a twin drive shaft. Uh, I made the third <coughs> and the other shaft is set up to go into fourth or second. Depending on and that's right. computed, no, if you want to upshift or downshift. Based on <laughs> inputs that you're giving it, it, that's where it sees like, hey, if you're wide open throttle in third gear, it, it's like, okay, he's wide open throttle, or, and so it's, that's, there it, it's going to go up. Now, if you come off throttle at the same time and, and go to the brakes, it'll go, hey, he's, he's come off throttle, went to the brakes, and Gonna activate the next year, but there's a lot of learning that goes on. If you if if uh, if you can drive your car on the track, and then you drive it on the street, that track day will it te that that learns, and then you see that like you notice that the shifts are different on the street. It, it'll hang in gear just a little bit longer, and that's where some of these guys is like yeah, we've had I've had calls go. Hey, I went to the track day, and now it's it's shifting different. So I have to explain to them the, the learning that it does, and it's and it's constantly learning every every day. What's interesting, I find, is the shifts occur in milliseconds. Yes, they're actuated by hydraulic. Yes, which is kind of to me, I find that intriguing that hydraulics can shift that quickly because it's. It's a matter of, I'm going from, from, in this, your dual clutch, so you've got your outer clutch, and this is your inner clutch. 
this clutch, you're, you're in this gear. This next clutch is just a matter of the pressure is there. It's a matter of closing a valve and opening a valve to switch. Yeah, so it's already pre-pressured. It's just a matter of basically opening and closing a valve. It doesn't have to build that pressure. Good. Question on the, on the PDK operation. One thing I've noticed, like even in manual mode, Sport Plus, um, it seems that it'll do, sometimes it'll do um, downshifts if you hit the kick down position, I guess, in the accelerator. Is there any way to prevent that or just not, it's just not going all, all <laughs> so, the way? Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, I think so that's, a, that's really a sore spot for me because on track, you know, I want to know, you know, even if you're driving a PDK, I want to be in the gear I want to be in. Right. Um, there are programs out there that can basically lock all that out so it won't do anything without a command from the driver. Um, the, yeah, and, and what I've found driving on track is, yeah, if you can just kind of feather right around that sort of kick down, you can keep it from doing that, um, but it's still not foolproof. You know, so, yeah, it's definitely annoying. You guys do, general question, you guys do brakes, alignments, other things other than engine and transmission. Yep. What, what don't you do? Like body work, interior? We, we don't directly do body work. We work with a body shop that's very, very, very good. So case in point, there's a car over there, a 911, that somehow found the uh, turn five wall at Road Atlanta. <laughs> so we stripped it down. All the all the damaged parts are out of it. It's going to the body shop. It's going to get repaired. it will come back. We'll bolt all the, all the parts back on, all the good parts back on, and then basically get it ready again for the track. Do you have interior back connections as well? For we work with there? Top Stitch Upholstery in Ballground. Um, they do excellent work. Uh, look them up on Facebook. They do great stuff, and you don't have to go through us for that. I mean, work with them direct, but they're a really good shot. Dual mass flywheel. Uh, I th seem to remember old 964s had a dual mass flywheel, and you could upgrade them by just getting a single mass flywheel or a lightweight flywheel. Is that possible in the PDK? Can you no, nothing out there right now that's available. Nothing can available. you have it machined in light? Or no. 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 Could you? Probably. Uh, yes. That's a whole R&D project that we are definitely uh, not prepared to get into. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And it's not, you know, it's not something that, you know, these aren't like items that need to be replaced every 20,000 miles either. I mean, it's, you know, so it's really just something you do, something you do when you're doing a rebuild. So once your transmission needs a rebuild, you know, 100,000 miles or more, or it starts slipping, that's when you worry about. I was just thinking in terms of light, lightning and reciprocating mass there, you know, the ro yeah, rotating the, mass. I would, have, I would imagine, and I'm just speculating, also I'm an engineer by education, so I've worked in the automotive industry for 10 years, and I just got to imagine that has a whole slew of issues down the chain mm -hmm. that start affecting shifting and everything else at the same time, mm -hmm. I guess. And if you go into something we see regularly on uh, the manual car is a lightweight flywheel to your factory dual mass. Mm -hmm. We see that engine noise and it changes things in how the car handles via engine management because it sees different vibrations and it can actually pull timing. Doug can, can testify to this. Knock sensors will start picking up odd noises and pulling timing. And, yeah, yeah we, we can try to Solid get... Solid motor mounts, same thing. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But we used to mess with all that stuff and all those cars from the 70s and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's, that's yeah. when it didn't matter. Yeah. 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 That's yep. a good word, you messed with it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's decision. There's probably a million ways to break it and only yeah. one way yeah. to do it right. Exactly. So. <laughs> yes. We've actually seen single mass flywheels with the wrong combination break crankshafts. Uh, so ooh. it's way better to stay with that dual mass flywheel to protect your engine. <clears throat> Can you do lines on the master motors? Yep. Yep, we do all that kind of service. What is that run roughly? I'd have to go back we'll go and, and grab one of our, yeah, we can let you know. All right, thanks. Do you have any experience with the aftermarket PDK reflash for the computer? Uh, we've had customers that have done them, and I haven't personally done one. But I've got enough customers that have. And they're changing what a lot of them do. That'll change clutch pressures and line pressures. And for the average guy, they're unneeded. Yeah. Okay. 
and I would say a lot of the cars, we're, we do a lot of work at the track with Caymans that are full on race cars. And I'd say about half of them have it, half of them don't. And I've driven them all. <coughs> really can't tell the difference. I, I had the LN engineering oil filter. The spin on roll? Huh? It's uh, changed. Uh, do you notice any any kind of difference between that type of filtering and the Porsche filter? Just on, on the engine itself? Or do you have the spin on oil filter adapter? Yeah. Yeah, so the there's a couple of advantages to that adapter. One is the factory filter canister, that plastic housing. Over time, there's a bimetal spring in the bottom of that, which is a release valve. And what that does is instantaneously, when you start the engine, it bypasses that valve for just a split second and allows dirty oil to circulate through your engine. And it's a microsecond. Well, over the years, that spring gets weaker and weaker and weaker. When it gets hot and cold, hot and cold, hot and cold, it loses its ability to seal. So you can have a leak by, you can have dirty oil getting into your engine on a regular basis. And when you first started up cold with good thick oil, that thing stays open for a much longer time. And you're getting all that crud that's in the bottom of that little canister just washing into your engine. Well, this doesn't make any sense. So every time you replace the filter, and we spec out specifically Napa Gold or Wix. Right. So that filter. Wix made that Gold filter for years. Now they're not anymore because the new Wix 51348 is made in China. Mm -hmm. Don't agree with it. So stick with the Napa Gold. They're still made in the US. That's a 1348 filter. That has a brand new check valve in the bottom of it every time you put a filter on. Also, it does not allow that split second blow by. So you're not getting any dirty oil back into your engine, plus the micronic filtration inside that filter is better than the factory paper out. Well, I love it because it's just easier to match. Absolutely, and that's, that's, <laughs> the, that's the best part for all of us, right? For me, the, those plastic housings, whether it's on my 911 that I've had or, or this current boxer that I have, the, the plastic housing is just so much more difficult to, it is. to get started. It is. Now, also, all of us knowing what we know, when you pull that metal filter off, you still want to cut it open and check the, yeah. the media. So we have a really nice cutter that we sell, and you cut it open, it's like a big can opener, and it just cuts a very clean edge, and you drop the canister out, you can check inside the lid, you know, the bottom of the can, and you can also cut your filter, you know, the filter media out with a razor knife, like you would with a regular filter, and then you can spread it out like an accordion and take a check. Uh, I recommend one more piece to go along with the metal uh, or the spofa, we call it spofa, spin on all filter adapter, is a filter magnet. Right. So that little filter magnet sticks on the side of the filter. You change your oil, you move it to the next one, you move it to the next one. You only have to buy that thing once. And there um, the magnetic drain plugs are really good, but that's giving you just a little glimmer as to what's going on inside the engine. If you have that filter magnet on the side of that filter and you pull it off and you cut it open and you see a bunch of metal trapped in there, you might not even see anything in your subplate. So again, that catches anything that's ferromagnetic moving through the engine. And, and I'm still good for like track days using the, the gold filter. Oh yeah, okay. absolutely. When we were, and if you guys don't know, I was Jake Ramey's general manager for the past 10 years. So I ran Flat Six Innovations for him for basically 10 years. Uh, through a merger, Flat Six Innovations and LN came together and now Jake has changed his program, so we're not building engines all apart like we used to at Flat Six. So all of that happened, and I wound up going to the LN side of things. So now I'm sales and technical support. We were really lacking somebody that had technical knowledge to be able to get information back to you guys. There's a lot of questions that come in every day, and most of the people up there are engineers, but they don't have practical application into the cars that are out on the road. That's me, I'm the missing link. <laughs> so if you have questions, you can always email me. These guys know a lot more. And when I first met them, of course, I didn't know them from anybody. But talking to Brian and Todd and the guys in the shop here, it's like, yeah, they know what they're doing. So this has been a huge resource for me also, especially on PDK, 
because I didn't know anything about PDK until I met them. So this is a huge education for everybody, including me. Uh, and the way that transmission works is just mind-boggling. It really, it's like, how the heck did they figure that out? You know? <laughs> so anyway, but yeah, I'm here to help. Anything you guys need, let me know. And same thing, you know, they're, uh, Todd and, and Brian are an excellent resource. They'll answer questions too. But um, at the end of the day, we have all kinds of stuff that can help you keep your cars alive. That's that's the whole game plan, right? So we got canister. Yeah. You sell oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, it's a spin on oil filter adapter. Yeah. And then you put a gold filter. That's a Napa gold. Napa yeah. gold. Yeah. Not, not you can go to any Napa. So it's better than the Ford. God, yes. I don't. Uh, we don't run an engine without it. And that find adapter. Yeah. And it's easier to read. The other one is to read. You specify. Really? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, nice. We actually have one. So we have this this uh, this black beam here. Actually, a customer up in Pennsylvania bought this car, sent it to us sight unseen. We're going through this entire car and building it into a track car. But uh, Ryan here has one of these kits we're talking about. It's going to go on that car pretty soon. I have a uh, manual transmission question, if you mind. Yeah, let's Okay. So the Napa Gold Builder is better than you go on the Pelican Park yes. and you pick the, the, the Porsche OEM? Yes. Yeah. Step on there this is the spin on filter adapter. And then you screw a regular filter on it. So you eliminate that can. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah. 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 through LN. 10% off? <laughs> Actually, all these things right now are on sale till the end of the month. Okay. So unfortunately, it's like it's only a couple of days, but you never know. I mean, um, I'll go back and I'll put the word in the day first. Tomorrow. Uh, yes. Yeah. Email me. I'll see if I can do anything. Yeah. So you don't have to go shopping. tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Question. Till tomorrow. Yeah, I have an 09 C2S, and I have 188,000 miles on it. Nice. Wow. But I've had a manual transmission problem with it. For, I had a Boxster before that, I had 197,000 on it and blew two engines, but that's a whole other set of stories. <laughs> I drive these cars a lot, so yes. obviously. So anyway, for the last 150,000 miles, I have had the first gear jam, okay? It just won't go in. It, the car was undrivable. I was ready to take it to the dealership. I didn't know what to do. But anyway, I changed the fluid with the Mobile Lube PTX that's in my manual, and it transformed the car. It made it usable again, but it still jams. And, I, I, and now I'm starting to get a jam going in reverse. But I change the fluid every 30,000 miles. This is 150,000 miles of this. I seem to have stopped any deterioration. What's going on? And is there a better fluid that I can put in there to make it more slippery or something? I'm afraid to do anything different. Actually, yeah. I mean, if anything, you want a thicker fluid, right? No, no, no. Yeah, that kind of mileage is actually sounds like a manufacturing defect in it. Because it's been 150,000 miles of usage. So it started early. Uh, yeah, at, at about 50,000 miles of usage. I mean, it could have also, I mean, did you have the car since new or? No, somebody had it before me. So that's a, that's kind of the unknown. You know, it, that, that would be the thing I would be suspect of is was there some, you know, damage prior to getting the car. You know, you're looking, I mean, you're basically just looking at wear, right? It's you know, synchros and, and then there's, you know, just there's tons of parts in there that, you know, over time can start to wear out and then you're, you're tolerances start to get off a little bit. And that's, you know, we've seen it on the auto transmissions, Porsche transmissions, you name it. So it's just, that's the nature of the beast at that mileage. I suspect it was the original owner because I had to change the clutch at about 80,000 miles. Mm -hmm. And on my Boxer, I got a hundred, the second engine blew at 197, and it was on the original clutch. Mm -hmm. That's all the downshifting, all right? That's all the rev matching. Mm -hmm. So I'm very proud of it. But yeah, I kind of blame the prior. Uh, yeah, and if he was a, a, a little, uh, the, as we all know, Porsches don't like to be manhandled in their shifters and manual cars. It will break things and stretch his cables and causes a lot of other issues. And there, I mean, there are, and that brings up a good point, there are some things you can look at is cable adjustments and clutch adjustment, that sort of stuff as well. How do you adjust the cables on? <laughs> they stretch and then they start doing different things. 
Yeah, there's, there's some very special tools that I can I take everything apart and snap some pieces in, and there's an adjustment there that I can do. I'm sorry to keep monopolizing this, but the adjustments that I know, of, because I put the numeric shifter in, the adjustments at the at the shifter, yep. um, as I thought, it was really only to make the stick stand straight up. Well, Does it a, but there's adjustments at the on the transmission side. Oh, uh, uh, if you go to there's adjustments on the transmission side if you go to the numeric shift cables. Oh, uh, and you think that might help, huh? Uh, it is possible. I was going to say, can you put them in? Sure can. Yeah. <laughs> we have. Got a checkbook? Yeah, okay. the, the, worst, the, the worst part of putting the cables in is honestly getting the center console out. Because we've had to take seats out to get the center console out. Uh, and I didn't have to do that. I got it all out. If you have stock out. seats, you can do it. We've yeah. had customers that have got race seats in. and I, It's all free and move it. Out. I can't get it out. I have to take a seat out. But you're getting back, so the, you recommend the cables first and maybe a different kind of fluid? Because that's easy to do too. Yeah, the, um, the, the, I mean, the, the, the fluid is going to make a very, very small difference, but you know, again, any little bit helps you know, to keep that thing going. So. Yeah. yeah, I would do cables. I'll tell you, 30,000 miles, I change it and it gets better. I can feel it deteriorate over time. I mean, because I put so many damn miles on it. Which speaks volumes too, and that's and also. I mean, it's funny you just said thirty thousand miles, but that's why we're recommending a PDK service at thirty thousand miles as well, because that fluid does break down over time. So yeah, you're experiencing that on the maintenance. So. We're talking thirty thousand miles, and not two shots. years. One's in one ways. Yeah, I mean, on the, on the street, yeah, that's fine. I mean, it is a seal. Make this a sealed unit, so it's it's okay, you know. But but again, if you're at you know, ten plus years, yeah, it's probably time anyway. Oh so. yeah, yeah. 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 I think the manual, if I'd have to verify it, but I think the manual says 60,000 or 8 or 10 years. Might be, I think 60,000 or 10 maybe. For my car, for manual transmission fluids, it's I think it's 120,000. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I don't care. Probably. I don't care what oil is out there. There's no oil that's going to last 60,000, let alone 110 for, for anything. Cool. All right. What? One uh, more. One more. I, I got one more. Yeah. Well, I got you here. <laughs> I have no problem jumping in and saying a couple things and answering some more questions or whatever you guys want to do. Okay. Yeah, yeah we can answer question. questions after this and talk on It's a control arm question, so whatever. Yeah, that might be more. Cool. Yeah, when we're done, go okay. find it. Listen. I thought I thought a little more. This might be a little bit better than the electrical. Right. Kind of recalibration procedures you do with a painless on these cars. I don't know if that's yeah. something that you can do. There is a calibration I can do to like adjust for the wear that's in there. If you're feeling something off, yes. That, we've, that tends to cause more problems to do it preemptively than anything. And that's because, I, don't, I can tell you, I've gotten calls from uh, India. India? Canada um, yesterday. Canada and the Dominican Republic so far of people that said, oh, the, I wanted to try to recalibrate my transmission and now I can't get it to move. Right. So don't recommend it unless it absolutely needs Yeah, unless you have an issue. And if there's something going on, then yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, they put an engine in my car and I would highly recommend it. Right now, <laughs> it, it definitely had some issues. <laughs> yes, I have asked. Yeah, that one. Uh, that one failed. Bam. This is for a later model. This is for a 981. The other ones that you'll see for the M9X series engines don't have this extra piece. Uh, so when these go on, there is a torque spec. It's 18 foot pounds. When you tighten this thing up correctly. We've had people over tighten filters, and that has been a problem where then the whole thing comes off together. 
So I actually have one guy right now, he's an attorney, he's mm -hmm. from Washington, D.C., and he thinks he knows better than all the rest of us <laughs> combined, right? Mm -hmm. So I sent him to a friend of mine to have the filter and the, the, the adapter taken apart. But what he did was he said, well, I do what I do with all my oil changes, and I put the oil filter on as tight as I can get it by my hand, and then I turn it another half turn with a wrench. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. He's never lost an oil filter. No. <laughs> So he said he didn't do anything wrong. We all know that that's not the case. Oil filter you know, assembly is tightened until it touches, and then about three quarters to a full turn by hand. You shouldn't ever have to put a wrench on a filter to tighten it up correctly. You might have to use something to kind of break the initial seal, obviously lubricate the seal with oil. Don't use grease. Uh, I, I did that as a youngster when I was first starting out. I put some grease on the seal, and yeah, I don't think that filters. I think it's still on the engine. <laughs> so, anyway, dumb mistakes we all make along the way, right? But these adapters, if you install them correctly, you shouldn't ever have a problem. But then the question that was just brought up to me was, if it comes off, okay, well, you separate the two things. You can replace this O-ring. This is the same as the factory O-ring seal. So again, this is, this is easy stuff. You can use the factory OEM O-ring, or you can order a new one from us. We have a little O-ring package. So it's easy to do. It's a really good upgrade for everybody's engine. Uh, now, obviously, the 9A1s, a lot of them have that oil filter on the top. We don't have a replacement for that yet. We've looked into it, but there just is no benefit to it because it doesn't have that check valve system and everything like the other ones do. Um, Again, products that we sell, like our sump plate costs more than this other aftermarket system. Ours adds a half a quart of fluid capacity, and then it is a far superior cooling. It actually is a heat sink, too, so it helps keep your transmission fluid cool at the same time. Again, yeah, ours is a lot more money. Well, we put a lot more engineering into it, so anyway. <laughs> it's a very, very nice machine-built yep. piece. It is. <laughs> And that's it. That's the key. It's not cast. It's billet. Um, the shift upgrades, you know, like I said, it's a billet system that we've built. Actually, it was designed by somebody else, and Charles liked it so much that he wound up buying it. So now it's an LN product. Um, we have a lot of pieces that are, are that way that are developed, and, and we do air cool. We do Porsche uh, water cool. Um, there's drain plugs for just about anything you own. So if you have multiple different cars, check out our website. We have magnetic drain plugs that fit just about everything. Uh, transmission drain plugs, um, everything from BMW, Mercedes. You know, we have so many drain plugs. I walked back through the, the one aisle in the, the uh, parts department, and this whole shelf that was like 15 feet long was nothing but drain plugs. I'm like, how many drain plugs do we make? <laughs> Uh, we've got new developments too. A lot of them are stainless steel now instead of aluminum. But make sure you guys are paying attention to this torque spec on all of these because torque spec is really, really important. Because it's a harder product than the factory pan, you can over tighten and strip the pan. So just pay attention to the torque specs on all this stuff. It's really important. Um, cooling, we're talking about PDKs. So we do have remote oil coolers for their transmission oil coolers. Cooling is really the biggest. Thing that you guys can focus on to keep everything alive, right? More fluid and cooler temperatures keep your engine and your transmission alive as long as possible. So we have all kinds of products. CSF radiators, if you guys aren't familiar with these, they're direct bolt-in. They're all aluminum pieces. They add uh, like up to 40% cooling capacity just by changing the radiators in the car. All these things, these guys can do for you. Um, we, we sell them direct. To you, but I do recommend if you're wanting the, the, uh, Todd and, and Brian to do the upgrades, let them source it for you because then they'll carry the warranty on your behalf. Yeah. And it, it works out way better if you just come in and say, I want the CSF radiator upgrade and let them take care of it for you. Uh, anything like that, all of, all of our products, and then we support it, we stand behind it. If you guys have questions, you can email me. It's Judd with one D, J U D, at lnengineering.com, and I'm happy to answer anything I can. So um, if I don't know the answer, I will point you in the right direction or I'll find the answer. You very rarely will get a mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like saying I don't know. I, I like to learn as I go. So anyway, um, 
anything else you can think of? Or? Appreciate that. Any other quick questions? And then I'll be yeah. hiding over in a corner somewhere and you can come find me if you have any more yeah. questions. We'll all be milling around here. You can talk to any of our guys or Ryan and I will be hanging up for a little bit and ask questions. Happy to help.